Welcome to another installment of Democracy Ideas with the International Forum for Democratic Studies. I'm Chris Walker, and I'm delighted to have with me today Steve Heidemann of the U.S. Institute for Peace, who's here to discuss his Journal of Democracy article, Syria and the Future of Authoritarianism. Welcome, Steve. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Chris. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, Steve, in your article, you cite the adaptations the Assad regime has made since the onset of the uprising in Syria. What are the main ways in which violent conflict has triggered adaptations that have enhanced the Assad regime's ability to survive? The one that I would single out as most important for its survival is the way it has absorbed, integrated, and professionalized into its security apparatus what had been a very large but very loose and, and somewhat uh, incohate network of loyalists who performed a variety of functions for the regime, uh, often supporting criminal activities of regime elites, often playing a role as uh, the protectors or, or bodyguards of key regime figures. And as the uprising escalated, as the regime began to expand its effort to repress this, this uprising, it began to draw those individuals increasingly closely into the security apparatus of the regime. They underwent formal training. They've now been, been linked very tightly to the, the armed forces. They have much more centralized command and control. And I think if, if the regime had not proven able to take this very loose um, network of criminal elements and build them into a much better organized, more coherent feature of its overall security apparatus, it would have a much tougher time than uh, we've seen in maintaining its control and ultimately in, in surviving the uprising. How has the Assad regime's ruthless and exclusionary approach in Syria contributed to broader trends towards regional sectarian polarization? You know, almost from the first day that protests began, the, re the regime was very explicit in its intent to define the protests in sectarian terms. And one of the consequences of framing this conflict in these terms is that participants in the conflict, both in the opposition and on the regime side, began to look outside of Syria for support, for patrons, for funders, who would align themselves with one side or another, almost entirely on the basis of sectarian affinities. So that we have the regime, which has drawn very heavily on Hezbollah, which has drawn very heavily on Iran, reinforcing the impression that the regime is, is tightly aligned to this network of Shia actors in the region. And on the other hand, the opposition, which consists um, predominantly of Syria's Sunni community, even though it's diverse in its representation. And they have turned in, in, in their own way to the Sunni governments in the Gulf, to private individuals of means throughout the Middle East, uh, who they see as potential funders, donors uh, for their activities. And so one of the consequences of this has been to transform the Syrian uprising, or as the opposition describes it, the Syrian revolution, into a form of proxy conflict organized along sectarian lines in which the borders of the Syrian state really no longer contain the conflict. So not only is sectarian polarization dangerous and, and, and quite disturbing to see develop within Syria, but it's these regional ramifications that I think make it even more troubling. And how critical has been the support from other regimes like Russia and China in ensuring the Assad regime's survival to date? Russia has been critical uh, as a supporter of the regime. China has played uh, a secondary role. But Russia has been extraordinarily important in the defense of the Assad regime. It has insulated the regime from efforts to use the UN Security Council to hold the regime accountable for its behavior. In addition, Russia has been a critical su supplier of weapons to the Assad regime. Uh, the Russian government claims that it is simply implementing existing contracts, but it certainly has the capacity, if it wished, to withhold those arms in a way that might demonstrate um, that it's preference is to see this conflict come to an end. 
And it's also been a provider of economic resources to the Assad regime, signing contracts that give the regime access to capital and that give it access to critical supplies like fuel, without which it couldn't uh, sustain its, its military operations. So by insulating the regime from international institutions, by supporting it within um, global diplomatic arenas, through its financial support, through its military support for the regime, through the advisors it's provided to the regime, it's been one of the critical factors keeping the regime uh, in power. And if you were to fast forward, say, one year from now, uh, given the very tough environment that we see in Syria and the difficult possible outcomes that we can imagine there, what would you imagine would be the best uh, outcomes given the circumstances? It does seem to me that if we wanted to find any possibility for um, a less pessimistic scenario to emerge over the next year, it would be the consolidation of some form of ceasefire that would permit many Syrians who are now displaced or refugees to return to their homes, might permit some degree of, of normalcy to return to the everyday life of Syrians, and might permit reconstruction activities to get underway that would begin to undo some of the quite extraordinary damage from this conflict. I, I can imagine a, a condition in which the regime and the opposition have both recognized that there is no way to prevail uh, on the battlefield. Uh, the country remains more or less divided. A kind of de facto form of partition has taken hold. Uh, as a result, levels of violence uh, have dropped as each side begins to work to consolidate its control within its own piece of what had been a unified Syrian state. I think any, any um, uh, situation in which the parties um, begin to focus more heavily on governance, on reconstruction, on securing their control over the areas that they now, um, that they now dominate um, is likely to bring uh, a decline in some of these regional trends that are really very, very troubling and potentially quite destabilizing. Thank you very much, Steve Heidemann. It's been great to have you here. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.